Welcome to the WellMed Institute's regular webinar series, which has as its purpose to highlight the immense diversity of the Baha'i teachings and the ways they contribute to the contemporary world, particularly to the prevailing discourses of society. Today, we turn to the mystical aspect of religion, which is essentially the spiritual development and transformation of the individual. But as we shall see, the Baha'i conception of mysticism is rich, complex, and perhaps not quite what many people think it is. Informing us about this topic will be Dr. Varga Bolodo Taifi. He has a BA in Advanced Baha'i Studies from the Baha'i Institutes in Iran and a PhD in Politics and international affairs. He's worked across the public and private sectors in trade and investment policy, and indeed will be going back to that task in less than a year when he returns to Australia. His research interests include Baha'i theology, Islamic philosophy, Baha'i economics, comparative religion, asymmetric conflict, coercive diplomacy, and terrorism. He currently is serving in the research department at the Baha'i World Center, and he joins us today from Haifa. So we have him speaking in a moment about this topic of mysticism. But first, I would like to mention our upcoming events so that you are aware of some other uh, aspects of the Wilmot Institute's programming. We have a webinar starting on April 16th, Compassionate Era, the Baha'i Teachings on the Animal Kingdom, and we think that will be particularly interesting to many of our audience. And then we have several courses coming up in the month of March. Baha'u'llah's Baha Early Mystic Writings starts on Wednesday the 8th of March, covering the Hidden Words, Seven Valleys, Four Valleys, and various other early texts that Baha'u'llah revealed. Then on March 22nd, Film as a Vehicle for Contributing to the Betterment of Society, uh, an interesting course basically on the use of, of movies. Uh, we, we think it'll be quite helpful for people to develop ways to do meaningful conversation with their friends as they use film. And then if you are concerned about preserving the archives of your local Baha'i community, a Baha'i archives course starts on March 29th through June 20th. It's a lengthy course because of the amount of material covered. So that summarizes um, the events that are coming up. And we will now turn to Varga for our presentation today. Varga, so, thank you so much for joining us. We're really looking forward to hearing what you have to offer us. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stockman, for your kind invitation and for your kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my great privilege to speak to you today uh, about mysticism and the Baha'i faith in, in what I'm sure uh, will be a repetition of what you already know. Uh, and of course, among you are several researchers and scholars and, and respected teachers of mine. I'm ashamed that I'm daring to venture to present anything before you and that you are here today really is a testimony of how you have always graciously nurtured and supported me and encouraged me. Thank you. Friends, in this webinar, uh, I will first introduce Baha'u'llah's mystical writings and briefly describe uh, Baha'u'llah's approach to using mystical concepts and, and themes and discourses and symbols. Uh, then I'll examine the Baha'i view on, on conventional practices, uh, doctrines, experiences, institutions that are really the, the conventional or traditional loci of, of mysticism. Then I'll present from the Baha'i writings, uh, the object of the spiritual journey in the Baha'i faith, and then provide uh, some insights and uh, comments on, on Baha'i doctrines, Baha'i concepts, uh, practices that redefine mysticism, but, but continue nevertheless the mystical narrative. 
Uh, and I'll conclude finally with a discussion of how the Baha'i faith offers uh, an organic uh, alternative to, to organized mysticism. Uh, but to do that, it's, uh, it's good to start with, uh, with some definitions of, of mysticism. But we know that throughout history, uh, the term mysticism has been used in many different senses, many associated with supernatural phenomena. Uh, some associated with occult practices uh, and criticize it with, with prejudice. Some might define as mystical or as mystical experience things like uh, religious visions uh, and, and auditions, uh, religious feelings of awe, of feelings of sublimity, um, or things like a, a direct uh, intuitive comprehension or understanding of God or sense of his presence. Um, sometimes a, an experience of nothingness or emptiness is also defined as a mystic experience. Uh, some define out-of-body experiences, uh, telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, and even Zen uh, as, uh, as a mystic state or, or mystic experience. Others uh, restrict the definition of mysticism to unitive experiences, uh, such as those of a feeling of oneness with nature or, or feeling of union with God. Because of this, um, the, the diversity of meanings, uh, a definition of mysticism has to be descriptive or stipulative, at least partly. In a narrow sense of the term, technically, mysticism is really understood as a specific system of, of deliberate practices uh, that, that generate uh, direct uh, and non-sensory experience of, of that ultimate truth, if you may, or, or of union with God or with the divine. But mysticism can also be defined broadly. Uh, in a wider sense, mysticism can be a cluster or a, or a constellation of practices, of, uh, of discourses, of of experiences, uh, of doctrines, texts, institutions, um, traditions that together uh, facilitate spiritual transformation, together facilitate acquisition of, of divine qualities and attributes, uh, and, and of uh, spiritual journey of the soul towards the, uh, the unveiling of truth. Now, let's first turn to, um, uh, to the text and the context in which certain um, uh, elements are used in the Baha'i faith. Um, it, so in its broader sense, what constitutes mysticism? We, we pay attention to some of these streams or some of these elements that, that constitute the, the constellation I just mentioned in a moment. First, text and context. We know in 1854, uh, Baha'u'llah left Baghdad for, for two years and withdrew to uh, uh, the mountains of Soleimaniyya in Kurdistan. This period of Baha'u'llah's withdrawal is reminiscent of Moses' withdrawal to Mount Sinai, uh, of Jesus' 40 days and nights in the desert, and, and Muhammad's uh, withdrawal um, uh, to, to the cave on Mount Hira. During this period, uh, at the request of various um, Sufi leaders, uh, Baha'u'llah elucidated uh, abstruse passages uh, uh, from Ibn Arabi's Al-Futuhat al, al one of the most celebrated uh, works in, in Islamic mysticism. Baha'u'llah also wrote um, a, a poem uh, in the rhyme and meter of, of Nazm al-Suluk of Ibn Farid, um, which is often referred to al, al qasida al Ta'iyya. It's really this, this work of Ibn Farid is considered to be the, the pinnacle of, of Arabic mystical poetry. Baha'u'llah won uh, the praise and respect of the Sufis of various orders uh, and continued even his relationship uh, with them after uh, his departure from Kurdistan. Many of Baha'u'llah's um, early writings include uh, themes uh, on, on the mystic quest and on the spiritual journey. 
Bahá'u'llah extensively quotes and glorifies the station of, uh, of notable mystics such as Rumi, um, Ibn Arabi, and others. In his mystic writings, Bahá'u'llah not only recognizes the, the, the truth of the spiritual quest in the mystic path, uh, but, but he also describes several principles that are quite central to mysticism. For instance, uh, the, the principles or the precepts of, of the journey of the soul to, towards the unveiling of truth. Baha'u'llah also unfolds the true meaning of, of mystic stations. He, he enumerates um, the requisite characters and attitudes and attributes of true seekers. Some of Baha'u'llah's best known um, works, uh, mystical compositions, include the Rash Ha'amah, uh, which is translated as the clouds of the realms above, the Lohe Kullo Ta'am, or tablets of all food, the Qasideh Varra'iyeh, Oda the Dove, the Four Valleys, the Hidden Words, Jawahir uh, al-Asrar, which is translated as gems of divine mysteries, uh, the Seven Valleys, uh, and finally the Kitab al Iran, or the Book of Satiety. Uh, now, as Dr. Stockman just mentioned, uh, there is an upcoming course, I understand, with Dr. Bach and, and mystical writings of Baha'u'llah, and I encourage all of you to, to do this course. Uh, now, these mystical works of Baha'u'llah mm, expound mystical themes uh, and, and terms and concepts like like the divine unity, um, like the divine presence, uh, the holy and the most holy outpouring, the unity of existence, um, themes like immanence and transcendence, manifestation and, and emanation, the spiritual journey, uh, the divine origin of creation and return to God, uh, the arc of of, of ascent and descent and, and uh, similar concepts. But through these writings, Baha'u'llah elevates really mysticism in its widest sense of the term to occupy a prominent station, a prominent position in the Baha'i dispensation. But, but these writings uh, introduced doctrines, discourses, um, themes that reconceptualize mysticism. They distinguish mysticism from the way it is defined and developed in, in other traditions. This is because Baha'u'llah's writings naturally are not devoid of um, social and historical context. Baha'u'llah does not use uh, mystical themes and concepts and terms in a vacuum. He employs them as a medium as a vehicle for the delivery of, of his revelation. But at the same time, he invests them with new meanings. Um, as such, we, we, we can say that, um, that Baha'u'llah simultaneously continues and discontinues the mystical narrative. He employs, yet redefines and recreates and reconceptualizes uh, mystical themes and terms and concepts. Um, I also feel it's important to, to emphasize that a contextual analysis of Baha'u'llah's mystical writings sheds light on, on Baha'u'llah's intention, on, on the authorial intention of these works. Just as Baha'u'llah sometimes, in, in many of his works, speaks in the language of, of a lawgiver. In some of his works, he speaks in the language of a, of a poet. Uh, well, or in the same way that, that some of Baha'u'llah's works and epistles are addressed to specialists in a field. For instance, sometimes he addresses uh, politicians uh, or theologians. Many of Baha'u'llah's mystical writings are also in response to, to specific questions uh, of particular audience in a specific point in time. Uh, so, these writings are not meant necessarily to be universal exhortations uh, that prescribe uh, behavioral norms or that uh, direct a set of 
concrete actions or, or direct mystical practices. Uh, now, in, in support of this argument, uh, I'll share this passage uh, from a tablet of Baha'u'llah that actually refers to the Seven Valleys, um, which is Baha'u'llah's greatest mystical treatise. This treatise, the Seven Valleys, was revealed in the language of the people in the days prior to our reclamation. The occasion for, for its revelation was the receipt of a letter addressed to the Most Holy Court in Iraq from a man of Sunni persuasion, who was both a scholar and a mystic. This treatise was therefore revealed in accordance with divine wisdom in the manner that was current amongst the people. However, in this day, every soul who hath fixed his gaze upon the supreme horizon and hath recognized the one true God, hath verily attained unto every one of the seven valleys or seven stations mentioned therein. Now, we know now but that Baha'u'llah does not uh, intend for his followers to engage in mysticism as a specific system of practice, um, or at least not in any way that is different from the practice of the Baha'i faith itself. In the Baha'i faith, unlike um, other mystical traditions, uh, spiritual truth uh, or acquisition of divine virtues and qualities and attributes or, or the journey of the soul towards spiritual truth are not achieved uh, through seclusion, through monasticism or through asceticism. Why, why is that? It's because Baha'is believe in the existence uh, and in immortality of the soul. The soul and body, as we know, together form a human being. Uh, the human soul emanates from, from the spiritual realms of God. It associates itself uh, with the body at the time of conception. Then it acquires divine qualities and attributes in this world to prepare for its return to the spiritual um, realms of God. The spiritual powers needed in the next life, we know, uh, must be acquired in this world, it, just as a fetus must acquire uh, the capacities that it needs later. Well, now, the association um, of the soul with the body lasts only in this life. So every moment uh, of life in this world becomes indispensable, it becomes extremely precious. Uh, Baha'u'llah states himself, uh, seize thy chance, for it will come to thee no more in the hidden world. Uh, you know, there is a common mystic belief that the world and the distractions within it impede the mystic quest. But the Baha'i teachings do not view the material world uh, with, with contempt or with, with disdain. The Baha'i teachings assert that, uh, that spiritual progress requires attention to the material imperatives of life. Um, for instance, the, the Bab has stated that the world of all the worlds of God, all the worlds of God revolve around this world. Uh, now, of course, we must not lose sight of, of, of that everlasting life that we must prepare for in this world, which means we should not get attached to this world. But Baha'u'llah commands us to engage in some occupation. It, you know, it's a law. He, he exalts it to the rank of worship. Uh, Baha'u'llah even praises uh, the acquisition of wealth. So, so Baha'u'llah condemns the life of seclusion. Uh, he condemns the life of isolation that is common among some mystics. Uh, for example, he urges the monks um, and, and priests, uh, as you see in this passage, uh, to, to give up the life of seclusion and to busy themselves with uh, that which will profit themselves and, and others. 
Um, so as you can see in this passage, he writes that um, he that secluded himself in his house is indeed as one dead. So mystic practices like um, abstinence from human interactions and speech have, have no place in, in the Baha'i faith. It's in fact the exact opposite in the Baha'i teachings. The proof uh, of the uprightness of character and of the rectitude of conduct is in association with others, is in engagement in everyday life. Abdul Baha states uh, that the, the ultimate goal of the mystic journey that is nearness to God is attained through service to humanity, um, is attained through um, unity with mankind, through loving kindness to all, uh, and service in the cause of universal peace. Um, we also know that other forms of asceticism, like, uh, like extreme forms of austerity, uh, like self-denial, uh, uh, like mortifications, um, acts of endurance, uh, some of which you can see in these images in the background, are denounced in the Baha'i faith. Um, idleness and, and mendicancy, uh, begging, are forbidden. Uh, and this is because they contradict living a, a fruitful life from which uh, humanity must, must profit. Baha'u'llah disapproves of even reading holy verses if it exceeds moderation. He states that, um, that reading a single verse um, with joy and radiance is preferable to reading all the holy books of God uh, with exhaust, exhaustion. This is because then it doesn't help one draw nearer to God. It defeats the whole purpose of the mystic quest. Um, Baha'i writings also uh, stress mindfulness. They stress sincerity of heart and purity of motive and attraction of the spirit uh, when one is reciting holy verses. Um, and we also know that in the Baha'i faith, worship is inseparable uh, from service. Uh, even, even the Baha'i house of worship, as you know, is, is a place that is dedicated to, to worship. It will have dependencies that will focus on, on service. So, so in summary, um, the Baha'i faith completely abolishes uh, the rules and the customs of asceticism, of seclusion, of, mm, of monasticism. Uh, it states that spiritual progress depends on detachment uh, depends on attraction of spirit, uh, depends on piety, piety of conduct, nobility of character, uh, purity of heart. Uh, and it can be achieved through praying, through educating oneself, through teaching others. These practices really exemplify that self-surrender uh, to God, that perpetual uh, reunion with God, which is essentially the highest uh, station of, of the mystic quest. And the Universal House of Justice summarizes you know, from the writings uh, the essential uh, requisites for, for spiritual growth uh, in a letter uh, written in 1983. Uh, the House of Justice has listed these elements as essential requisites for spiritual growth. Uh, obligatory prayers, reading sacred scriptures, meditation on the teachings, bringing our behavior into accordance with standards of the teachings, teaching the cause and, and selfless service. Uh, now, uh, let's turn our attention to uh, doctrines and discourses. Uh, the Baha'i view of God uh, and of manifestations of God and, and on the laws of God is really totally at variance with, uh, with the view of other mystical traditions. Uh, many mystics consider religious law um, as 
intended only for the uninitiated masses. Uh, they say that once those uh, on a mystic path attain the higher stages of spiritual truth, then religious laws are no longer binding on them. But Baha'u'llah calls for uh, highest regard uh, for divinely uh, revealed ordinances and, and prohibitions. Um, I must say that at this stage in my presentation, I was going to, to drink a glass of water accidentally on purpose. And, and you know, it's, it's 9.30 p.m. here, it, so, so I'm allowed to drink because it's way past sunset. Um, and then I was going to speak about observing the, the divine, re, re, divinely revealed uh, ordinances and, and prohibitions, but uh, my wife prohibited me from, from doing this. Um, and, and thought is distasteful because because the sun has not yet set for for many of you. So so I have to observe her prohibitions too. Uh, okay, uh, back to, to the topic. In in the seven valleys, uh, Baha'u'llah warns the wayfarer in the mystic path to stray not a hair's breadth from the law. Uh, for this is in, indeed the secret of the path and the fruit of the tree of truth. He also writes, in all these stages, he must cling to the robe of obedience to all that hath been enjoined and hold fast to the cord of shunning all that is forbidden, that he may partake of the cup of the law and be informed of the mysteries of truth. But Perhaps the biggest challenge uh, that the Baha'i faith poses to, uh, to the mystical narrative is the question of theology, in my view. Uh, the object of the mystic quest is union with God, whereas Baha'is believe uh, in a God that is transcendent, is inaccessible, is sanctified above all creations. Uh, mystics claim to understand God directly and experience his presence, uh, whereas Baha'is believe uh, God to be inaccessible, uh, unknowable, incomprehensible, and, and indescribable. Uh, it is essentially the very foundation of, of Baha'i theology to exalt God above ascent and descent, above habitation and incarnation separation and union, nearness and remoteness, relationship and association, direction and intimation, time and space. So a, a God that can be understood uh, is a Baha'i view, a, a God that can be understood, a God whose presence uh, can be felt, can be experienced, is really a figment of our imagination, uh, is created by, by human mind. Instead of our creator, Peace our creation. So really the highest form of the mystic quest is to confess our uh, powerlessness, uh, to understand the reality of God. I would like to share this passage uh, from a tablet of Baha'u'llah uh, on, on this theme. All that the sages and mystics have said or written have never exceeded nor can they ever hope to exceed the limitations to which man's finite mind has been strictly subjected. To whatever heights the mind of the most exalted of men may soar, however great the depths which the detached and understanding heart can penetrate, such mind and heart can never transcend that which is the creature of their own conceptions and the product of their own thoughts. Uh, but, uh, so, so you can see how, how this really um, strikes at the heart of, of the very object uh, of the mystic quest uh, in, in other mystical traditions. Now, Let's look at some passages um, from the writings of Baha'u'llah to see how Baha'u'llah redefines 
the purpose of mysticism. By self-surrender and perpetual union with God is meant that men should merge their will wholly in the will of God and regard their desires as utter nothingness beside his purpose. Whatsoever the Creator commandeth his creatures to observe, the same must they diligently, with the utmost joy and eagerness, arise and fulfill. They should in no wise allow their fancy to obscure their judgment. Neither should they regard their own imaginings as the voice of the eternal. Now, since um, the way to, to any direct intercourse with God and, uh, and also the way to, to experiencing his, his presence is, is blocked, God reveals himself to humanity through his representatives. Um, the recognition of these representatives, whom we call the manifestations of God, is identical with the recognition of God. Um, so Baha'u'llah emphasizes in the Seven Valleys that the references that have been made to the degree of mystic knowledge pertain to the knowledge of the effulgences of that Son of Truth as it becometh reflected in various mirrors. Now let's turn our attention to, um, to mysticism and revelation. There is a mystic touch to the Baha'i view of creation. Uh, Baha'is believe that, uh, that every created being um, emanates from God. Everything receives its uh, share of the, uh, of the outpouring of, of God's grace and bounties. Everything according to its station um, in this emanational procession enjoys a degree of existence. So everything, because of its very existence, carries a sign of God. Uh, now, of course, everything emanates from God. Uh, things do not manifest God. God is not, in other words, uh, divided into parts. Uh, he does not dissolve into various forms. He does not become incarnate in things. Instead, all things reflect God's perfections. And, and signs and attributes and, and names. So we know um, that, that if we get to know a created being through that we can find a path to that outpouring that emanates from God. So really we can say that in a specific sense, we can recognize the invisible through his visible reflection in this specific sense um, of the term. Um, we can say that God can be found um, in, in everything. God can be seen everywhere. So that is from this very specific sense of the term um, as it pertains to the, the process of universal revelation. Um, one can say that there is a mystic touch to the Baha'i conception of creation. But of course, uh, God can, can best be recognized through his manifestations because they're the perfect mirrors that reflect uh, perfectly all of God's signs and names and attributes and, and perfections. Baha'u'llah revolutionizes uh, the, the conception of experiencing the divine presence. He explains that attainment to the divine presence is not obviously not possible to anyone. Uh, but by attaining to the presence of God is meant um, attaining to the presence of the manifestation of God, as you can see in this passage. By this presence is meant the presence of him who is the day spring of the signs and the dawning place of the clear tokens and the manifestation of the excellent names. Uh, now, uh, perhaps we could turn our attention to uh, mysticism and its relationship with, with 
epistemology. Another key theme really in Baha'i discourse on mysticism is, is um, epistemology is, in other words, is knowledge generated through mystical experiences valid? Baha'is believe that um, the human soul is like a mirror. If it is polished, uh, it can reflect the rays of the sun of truth. Baha'is believe that the, um, the object of the mystic journey is really not dependent on any physical practice. Uh, unlike many uh, mystical traditions uh, in the past. The soul can perceive reality without the mediation of, of bodily instruments, of, of bodily organs, uh, just like in the state of sleep. Um, so Baha'i epistemology um, um, really harmonizes, uh, in a sense, um, it, it harmonizes our perception that's, that's gained through our senses. So, so it harmonizes sensory perception, um, reason, uh, religious revelation, and, and mystical enlightenment, uh, all as, as valid means of human understanding. So knowledge can be sensory, it can be intellectual, or it can be intuitive. Our understanding can be a result of sensory perception, obviously, and it can be a result of uh, rational perception, that is discursive learning or intellectual learning through scientific knowledge, through uh, religious revelation, but it can also be through spiritual perception, which is essentially through God's grace. It's um, through divine confirmations. So some insights, some meanings, some truths, some realities that cannot be comprehended by discursive uh, intellect can indeed be perceived through illumination, through revelations of the spirit. We don't need um, sensory practices to, to achieve the object of, of the mystic quest. In fact, we don't even need rational perception. We don't even need intellectual learning to acquire divine qualities and attributes uh, or to unravel uh, mysteries of the, of the universe. So really in Baha'i epistemology, um, spiritual perception, whether, whether it is an episode or an ongoing um, um, state, an ongoing experience, it can count as a mystical impression. Um, in the broad sense of the term, it can count as a, a mystical experience or a mystical state. Now, it's important to emphasize that there are no mystical concepts in the Baha'i teachings that are meant to deliberately uh, construct a mystical experience according to the narrow definition of the term. There are no concepts that are placed there in order to deliberately construct a mystical experience. Uh, you know that in other uh, mystical traditions, there are practices, for instance, uh, sensory, sensory deprivation, uh, stimulation uh, or regulation. For instance, things that are related to exercise things that are related to diet, to, to posture, to breathing. And these things in other mystical traditions are consciously employed in order to, to produce mystical experiences. There are no such practices in the Baha'i faith. Yeah, the Baha'i writings emphasize uh, that the only mystical states that are acceptable before God are confessing uh, God's uh, singleness, his, his supreme singleness, um, confessing his exaltation above all likeness, uh, recognizing God's absolute transcendence. Uh, Baha'is do not believe in, uh, in the immanence of God. We confess uh, God's absolute transcendence. Uh, we, we probably don't have time to, to delve into it right now, but, uh, but we can explore it at, at a different time. Uh, and 
and of course believing um, and, and observing the divine laws and, and avoiding selfish desires. So, so these are really the states, mystical states, if you may, that are acceptable before God in, in the Baha'i writings. Um, avoiding illusions, avoiding uh, uh, vain imaginings, um, avoiding vain interpretations. So say in, in a mystical state, a, a mystical state of true spiritual perception, what we might uh, experience um, in a material form, like a vision um, or, or a communication, is really in fact purely immaterial, even though it might manifest itself in a material form. This is because human soul is, uh, is sanctified from matter. So the only, the only mystical state that is, uh, that is specifically mentioned in the Baha'i writings and is accepted appears to be the state of prayer. Abdul Baha is reported as saying that, uh, that the, the state of prayer creates spirituality, creates mindfulness and celestial feelings, it begets uh, new attractions of the kingdom and it engenders susceptibilities uh, of, of higher intelligence. So the Baha'i writings suggest that this mystical state, the, the state of spiritual communion or the state of prayer, uh, can be constructed, in fact. It can be both constructed and maintained through meditation and prayer. And so aside from uh, attitudes of heart and mind that are important uh, in state of prayer, obviously, the writings also emphasize uh, on conditions, conditions uh, that can, that, that should be created, in fact, uh, in our surroundings, so external conditions, uh, as opposed to, or, or in addition to internal conditions that can maintain the state of prayer. You are no, no doubt familiar with these and we don't really need to, to spend any time on them, but I'll just briefly mention some of them that appear in the, in the Baha'i writings. For instance, um, we know of guidance on, um, on praying in private. We know that we're encouraged to pray in a melodious tone. We know that we are called to or encouraged to, to pray during times when one is uh, free of, of daily cares, uh, like at midnight. Uh, now, another element that we could uh, explore today is the element of institutions in, uh, in, in mysticism. Many mystical orders uh, function in, in hierarchical structures. Uh, they institutionalize uh, a master-disciple relationship. So in these structures, they believe that spiritual progress is possible only under the tutelage of a master. Uh, there is also esoteric knowledge, uh, and it is believed um, in these hierarchies or in institutions of mystic orders out there that esoteric knowledge uh, is sometimes kept within an elite inner circle. But the Baha'i teachings maintain that, that the human race has reached a stage uh, of collective maturity in, in its evolution. As a result, uh, Baha'u'llah has stressed um, independent investigation of truth uh, as as the tenet uh, of the Baha'i faith. Uh, and Baha'u'llah has really abolished uh, religious emulation. He's abolished altogether uh, the institution of clergy. He has replaced it with consultation as the foundation for truth. Um, we also uh, believe uh, that by reading, by studying, by, by meditating uh, upon the revealed text, we can unravel inner meanings and mysteries without having to follow a, a mystic sage, without having to follow a master. 
So really all spiritual knowledge uh, in the Baha'i teachings is available to everyone. So you see Baha'u'llah poses a great challenge to imitation, to, to hierarchy, to elitism in, in the mystic quest. Uh, one can say that he invalidates altogether the institutional basis um, of mystical traditions. Uh, in other words, Baha'u'llah democratizes mysticism. Uh, now to conclude um, tonight's presentation um, and summarize. So, so Baha'u'llah rejects uh, um, everything that really uh, constitutes the traditional loci of mysticism. Um, Anti-worldliness, he rejects. Seclusion, monasticism, uh, asceticism, the rituals. He condemns any notion of union with God, uh, of apprehension of God, uh, um, and, and experiencing the presence of God in this world. Baha'u'llah abolishes uh, priesthood, um, Baha'u'llah abolishes hierarchy and elitism. Um, um, another important point is that Baha'u'llah, when he uses uh, mystical themes, when he uses mystical terms and concepts, he uses them contextually uh, as a medium or as a vehicle for the delivery of, of his revelation. But he invests these terms and, and, uh, and concepts and themes with new meaning. In other words, Baha'u'llah does not abolish mysticism. He redefines it radically. He reinterprets its uh, conventional concepts and symbols. And another point to bear in mind is that um, the object of the mystic quest in the Baha'i faith then is spiritual growth, uh, acquisition of divine qualities and attributes, uh, and spiritual virtues and, and powers. Uh, and, and of course, the spiritual journey of the soul towards the unveiling of truth. But all of these things out there in the world, um, while living in society, while interacting uh, with people. Uh, so we can say that the Baha'i faith is fundamentally mystic in character. That's actually from a letter uh, of Shabi Fendi. He says that Baha'i faith is fundamentally mystic in character, but of course, its texts, uh, its doctrines, uh, its discourses, uh, its practices, um, what has it be covered? Its experiences, institutions, they offer an organic alternative to organized mysticism. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Barga, so much for this fascinating presentation and the uh, a presentation of the nature of the um, the Baha'i approach, I guess you could say, to mysticism and the nature of mysticism from the point of view of the Baha'i writings. There is a um, a kind of version of this particular presentation in printed form in a volume called The World of the Baha'i Faith by Rutledge, and Varga wrote the chapter in that volume about the Baha'i approach to mysticism, and it's really that chapter that uh, was the reason we invited him to to speak today. It really was quite a, a fascinating uh, chapter. I, I found it quite eye-opening because I had not ever thought through the uh, texts uh, the way Varga did. We have a few questions already, and um, I'm, I'm happy that we can now turn to those. Uh, Kayvon says, is there a distinction in the Baha'i view between divinely revealed prayers and man-made up prayers? And if so, um, how so, from both the point of view of faith and science? Uh, yes, 
Well, yes, I, I believe there are, um, um, because uh, as, as discussed and, and presented, we believe that there are several sources of knowledge uh, that we take as valid and we can tap into. Uh, one such source is religious revelation. Uh, another, and, and we access that and, and understand it through, of course, our rational faculties. But we also uh, believe in the spiritual perception and the spiritual perception can really, we can train it and, and we can receive uh, uh, spiritual uh, confirmations and divine revelations, not only through, through confirmations of God, but also through uh, making ourselves susceptible through state of prayer uh, and uh, and uh, you know the, the training our spiritual senses or feelings, if you may, through uh, attraction of the heart, purity of the soul, uh, attraction of the spirit. So there is a difference, but they are both uh, needed. Uh, if by man-made uh, prayers. Uh, you mean, you know, turning our attention to God uh, and, and living in a state of prayer. Uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm sure there is some impact to it because at least the, the intention and the attention of turning towards God will, will have some impact. Uh, but of course, we also believe that there is a, a potency and there is a power, a creative power in the words of God. Uh, that transforms, that creates. Uh, so, uh, so of course, it's, it's more potent rather than, than man-made prayers, if it makes sense. I've often thought that Baha'u'llah's um, exhortation that we bring ourselves into account each day is essentially a form of praying to God in our own words. Because when we bring ourselves into account, we're saying, I'm sorry I did this, Thank you for helping me do that. Please help me do this in the future. You know, and that's essentially praying to God in your own words. So I think in a way that's that's something that we're supposed to do. Um, another question we have here is the process of emptying one's mind in the common practice of mindfulness of mystical value from the Baha'i perspective. Right, emptying one's mind and mindfulness. Uh, so, as explored, if if this process involves any physical practices or or sensory deprivations, then it's not needed. We 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 do not believe that we need any sort of sensory practice or physical practice or experience in order to avail ourselves uh, of of intellectual learning and in the first place of, uh, of, of divine knowledge. Uh, we can do that only by turning our hearts and our souls uh, towards God and by purifying our souls. Uh, we do not need to engage in any sort of uh, physical practice in order to receive uh, non-physical <laughs> or, or spiritual confirmations or knowledge. Thane asks, when we pray and get some sort of answer or confirmation, if it's not God communicating with us, what or who is? Right. Uh, so, so I think this, this is a very important question because it, uh, it is about our, our uh, conception of God. Uh, you know, the, Many, many different groups have tried to, and, and, and really the answer to this question might be a bit, a bit involved and, and it might be worth uh, really spending a, a few minutes to, um, uh, to, to try to see how the Baha'i view of God uh, differs from, from uh, other traditions, other schools of thought. Um, you know, all uh, religions of God have always promised mankind that, that we will uh, attain to, to the presence of God. 
yet they've said that God is inaccessible. Um, at the same time, we know that we are all, all creation are signs of God. But at the same time, we know that there is, we've been told that there's a separation and otherness uh, between uh, humankind, between creation as a whole and God. So, so, so you're right, this question that you've posed, in fact, reflects a, a paradox and an existential crisis uh, that, or, or paradox to our, to our quest, a collective quest humanity throughout time that has always existed. And that is, how can we be promised something that's unattainable? How can we be part of something, but yet at the same time, we are essentially distinct from God. So some people have tried to come to terms um, with, with, with these paradoxes um, by explaining God in different forms. Some have believed in incarnation of God. Some have believed in deities or gods that manifest themselves through, through animals or, or other, uh, other beings. Some imagine God. And in the process of imagining God, essentially worship as their creator, something that is their creation. Uh, some have resorted to negating everything that is not God. Um, they are known as the followers of apophatic theology or negative theology. So they described, described God by, by stating what God is not rather than what he is. Um, and, and this includes, you know, some Shia thinkers, Kierkegaard, Maimonides, um, Thomas Aquinas, and, 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 and others. But, um, but, but they're also extreme. So these are people who are really more modest. They're extreme. So people who think it's possible to know God and become one with him. Um, and there are also people who, who think any attempt is futile. Um, all existence can be defined only in, in empirical terms, in material terms. They deny God and, and they even believe in futility of life. But um, so in, in these group of people that are in between, there are those who believe in transcendence of God. Um, now, Baha'is also believe in transcendence of God. We, in fact, believe in absolute transcendence of God. But to address your question, there is a, there is a subtlety in how we can understand the transcendence of God. Because those who believe in absolute transcendence of God, they believe that God is invisible. They believe that God has no names or attributes. They believe that God is exalted above any knowledge and experience. They believe that God has nothing to do with humanity, in fact. Uh, and in, it makes no difference in human life uh, whether or not we believe in God. God is defined as being uh, above existence, above time, above space. This God with this definition cannot be obeyed. This God uh, cannot be worshipped. This God cannot even be proved. To human mind, this definition of God is very similar to a definition of non-existence. That's why many people essentially have resorted to just believing that God does not exist. But the way that Baha'is address this question, is God communicating with us? How can we pray to God than if, if we truly believe in the absolute, uh, absolute transcendence of God. I feel the answer lies in, in the concept of manifestation of God. We, we have been even encouraged to say our prayers to God through his manifestations. We think of the manifestation of God as Baha'u'llah, manifestation of God through today when, when praying to God. Sorry for the, for the long comments, but I thought it's, it's important perhaps to frame why the Baha'i view of uh, of absolute transcendence of God uh, is workable because of the existence of the concept of manifestation, how it differs from uh, other, other beliefs uh, and other views of the nature of God and how it has tried to, to resolve uh, paradoxes in, in really religious history. Thanks. Uh, Lyle or Lisley, I guess, I'm not sure how the name is pronounced, asks this question. We understand that actual union with God, in quote marks, is impossible. In light of this, according to my humble and limited understanding of mystical traditions of Sufi Islam, 
God is considered to be the only entity that actually exists, that nothing other than or outside of God even exists to compare to God, i.e. absolute nothingness, absolute oneness. All else is mere illusion, and therefore the pinnacle of mystical enlightenment means completely surrendering to this awareness. Do I understand correctly that such a concept of our non-existence in relation to God aligns with Baha'u'llah's mystic teachings, i.e. the final valley of seven valleys is true poverty and absolute nothingness. Uh, yes, yes, I agree with you. Um, <clears throat> I think Abdul Baha explains in some answered questions the two conceptions of existence, the, the true two senses of existence. And he uh, explains you know, the, the chapter on the, the unity of existence. Abdul Baha explains that the followers of unity of existence, the, the common followers of unity of existence have misunderstood the, the original intention, the true exalted intention of the concept of the unity of existence. Um, so it's it's not that God has, uh, uh, has been resolved into various forms or has appeared or has manifested itself in, in countless forms. But the only existence, the true existence is the existence of God. And, uh, and it's like a gradation of existence. We take portions of, of the bounty uh, of the existence, that effusion of the grace of existence that has permeated uh, the, the hierarchy of, uh, of, of, of beings as they exist in the world and everything according to its uh, station in 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 the universe in the in the world of being uh, has partaken a, sh a share of of that existence but all our existence is as nothing when compared to the true existence that is the the um, the existence of the necessary being as Abdul explains in some answered questions i agree with you that's interesting it's strange to think that we don't exist in but it's true that we don't exist in the sense that God exists. It's a different kind of existence, I guess, is, is, is the answer there. Uh, James asks this, it is my understanding that those faculties of the soul we call psychic are to be used in the next world rather than this one. Is there anything in the writings as to what these psychic powers will be used for in the next world? Um, so what do we mean by psychic powers? Uh, if we mean the, the faculties of the soul, you know, the, the power of the soul, I think the whole purpose uh, of our life in this world is essentially to strengthen, to gain capacity, to enrich and empower our soul. That, that's the, the, the entire purpose of living this life in this world and the association of our, our soul with our body. So everything that we do should be for the purpose of gaining, uh, I feel, spiritual powers and presences that, that we will use essentially in the, in the next world. Um, for me, the, um, the metaphor of, of a child and you know, the, the fetus developing the capacities that it needs in this world is enlightening. If that, that is meant by the psychic powers, essentially powers of the soul, then yes, I think, uh, the writings are, are replete with ex exhortations of why um, we need to live in this life and what we need to do in order to gain the capacities that, that we need in the next world. Presumably psychic powers shouldn't refer to things like being able to move objects around with your mind, which you can't do in the next world, presumably because there are no objects in that sense. Uh, uh, perhaps it could, perhaps other things that they're, referring to under psychic powers are things like telepathy, being able to read people's minds, which might be an interesting violation of people's privacy uh, in the next world as well as this world. So, Giti has this question for you. Would you comment on the Baha'i view of dreams? Um, <laughs> I think he's a... <laughs> It needs a whole session. I think maybe Dr. Stockman could organize a, a presentation on on the Baha'i conception of dreams. Uh, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a very wide topic. I mean, if, if there is a specific aspect of dreams that that we could discuss, uh, I think we should. But I think the, the aspect of dreams that came up, I think, in the presentation and that uh, is related to the uh, to the specific topic at, at hand, and that, that is Baha'i faith and mysticism, is that um, just like in a state of dream, in the world of dream, you are able to, um, our soul is able to uh, to learn, is, evolve, is, is able to receive knowledge. Um, there are then states that without uh, the use of our sensory perception, even if, even without uh, our discursive learning, without our rational faculties, we will be able to partake of, uh, of truth, of, of spiritual knowledge. But I think all the other aspects of dream, I think there is, uh, we could have uh, I think an endless <laughs> discussion on, on, on the mysteries of dream, it, it perhaps needs a whole session. Yeah, Abdelbaugh does talk about people learning things through dreams, for example. So there is that whole question that could be explored, I suppose, uh, in the future. Charles asks this question, unlike the previous Seven Valleys and Four Valleys translation, in the call of the Divine Beloved, there are no headings of valleys to help the reader know when he or she is reading a particular valley. It makes it a more difficult read. Why is this offered in this way? Can you comment about the revised translation? Well, well I, I think that's perhaps a question that could be uh, put, uh, uh, you know, it, it could be asked <laughs> of the House of Justice, because I personally understand that the new translation is, is a translation that has been now authorized by the House of Justice. Whereas the, the previous translation was a very good translation, but it was not yet authorized. It was an early translation. Uh, so uh, now that this translation is authorized, uh, it must have gone through uh, uh, through rigorous comparison with the with the original language text, with the manuscripts uh, of of these two works. Uh, I'm I'm sure painstaking. <laughs> Uh, comparison and consultation and and a, a really rigorous process uh, to bring it in conformity with with established uh, you know translations uh, like translations of Shogi Fendi other translations authorized by the House of Justice and also in conformity with the original language text yep, now I'm not sure of the, of the particular reason uh, headings are removed but I think you could put that question to Presumably, the original text doesn't have headings within it. I presume. I don't know. I, I don't know the original text. Yes, it, it makes sense. <laughs> Let me see if we've got any others here. Uh, here is another one. What about the abilities of clairaudience and clairvoyance uh, from the point of view of the Baha'i faith? Unfortunately, I'm not familiar <laughs> in enough with the abilities of clairaudience and, and clairvoyance. Yeah, Sorry. I don't don't know that we have any specific guidance about it either. Though there may be something by Shoki Effendi somewhere. That's the sum total of the various comments and questions that we've received so far, and we may get a few more because. We, we really had a good audience today and a good number of, of uh, people asking questions. Um, I think if there's anything I wanted to particularly ask you about, I can't think of anything right offhand. So if we don't have any other comments, I guess I will thank you very much for this fascinating presentation today. Uh, and a really lovely, well-organized PowerPoint. Uh, I think we, we very much appreciate that. And, uh, oh, it's nice to have us back without the, without the, uh, um, the sh sharing as well. Thank you everyone for joining the WellMed Institute's webinar today. We hope you will share some of the ideas 
and the information you've heard today in your conversations with others. And please tell others to watch future webcasts as well. We look forward to seeing you again at a future program. Thank you very much and goodbye for now.